Hello and my journey around interesting aircraft continues with the aircraft behind me, a Douglas DC-4. This is an icon of civil aviation and in this video I'm going to take you on a tour around it. So let's check it out. I make videos about planes. If you're into trip reports and tours around interesting aircraft at airports, air shows and museums around the world, make sure you check out my channel and subscribe. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. During the early days of the DC-3, plans were underway for a larger four-engined prop liner. Initially, they developed the DC-4E, which was three times larger, was pressurized and had a unique triple tail fin design so that it could fit in smaller hangars. But it was just too expensive and the single prototype was rather awkwardly sold to the Japanese who reverse engineered it and built the Nakajima G5N bomber. In the end, Douglas simplified the design, which ended up being only double the size of the DC-3, and was unpressurized and came with a single tail fin design. But it did feature the four engines and came with a tricycle undercarriage. Now this aircraft was a military version known as the C-54 Skymaster, and was actually built in far greater numbers than the DC-4. This particular aircraft is special for a number of reasons. It was involved in the Berlin airlift, which flew in vital supplies to 2 million people after the Soviets blocked supply routes just after World War II. It was also part of the fleet that brought President Truman to the Potsdam Conference, as you can see in this photo here. Although, it is unknown if he was on this actual aircraft. From 1971, she was retired and stored at Davis Montham Air Base in Arizona. She was sold in 1975, and she's had many subsequent owners, including being impounded twice, once in the USA for non-payment of fees, and once in the Bahamas for alleged smuggling. Ultimately, she was brought to Australia in 1995 for Pacific Island freight operations, eventually being stored at Archerfield until being donated to Haas in 2008. Just last year, she was painted in this fantastic Qantas livery to celebrate their 100th anniversary, and while they did have a fleet of DC-4s, this one never actually flew for the flying kangaroo. Now let's walk around it and I'll point out a few interesting features. One advance they kept from the DC-4E was the tricycle undercarriage with the single steerable nose wheel at the front. Tail draggers, such as the DC-3, have their nose angled upwards, thus reducing visibility on the ground. They're also more likely to nose over, which is where they hit a bump or apply the brakes heavily, and the tail will rise and the props can hit the ground. Essentially, all modern aircraft since this use the tricycle undercarriage design. Moving further back, these rectangles open up to allow access to the batteries, which essentially act the same as in cars, although they're a lot bigger. This round thing is a chute where things could be dropped from inside the cabin, such as flares during rescue missions. This vent brings in air to cool some of the electronic equipment, and this white thing is a navigation antenna. Moving further back, we find spots where some of the navigation equipment would have been attached, as well as some service panels. This thing on the side would have been a transponder antenna, and here's where the automatic direction finder would have been mounted. This is an old navigation system that you can see in my DC-3 tour video, which essentially detects the direction of radio waves coming up from specific ground stations. This drain mast, painted red so that you don't hit your head on it, is simply a drain from the hydraulics bay, so any excess oil would drain out here. It's longer and further away from the fuselage than the other drains because you wouldn't want any oil skid marks sliding along the underside of the aircraft. Now here are a lot more drains. It's mostly water, but if any other fluid, including fuel and oil, although ideally not much of that, would simply drain out of these. Remember that these aircraft weren't pressurized, so large holes in the fuselage like these wouldn't have been a problem. On the side here is the aft lower cargo door. And wandering towards the back is the tail skid assembly. If the pilots get too enthusiastic after V2, and a stand can be bolted in here to keep the aircraft still during storage and strong winds. We'll wander back towards the wings and have a brief look inside the trailing edge flaps. Now you may have noticed small distinct panels throughout the aircraft's underside. 
These are all inspection panels. And for example, under this rectangle is the aileron control cables, fuel drain and shutoff valve. And under here is the outer wingtip attachment bolt. These allow easy access for the engineers during maintenance. Now these are Pratt & Whitney R2000 twin WASP 14 cylinder radial engines, which were upgraded versions of the R1830 found in the DC3. It was larger with an increased bore of 5.75 inches, but retained the same stroke, equaling a total displacement of 32.8 litres. But the main focus was on reducing manufacturing costs and increasing fuel efficiency. Depending on the fuel type, they could produce 1300 to 1450 horsepower each. Under the engine is the oil cooler, and that tailpipe, which is on the longer side of normal, works to direct the sound, oil and carbon underneath the wing. This is in contrast with that scene on the Super Constellation here, where you can see the flames shooting right out the side of the engines, which would have been quite stressful if you were on board, although it's perfectly normal. The main landing gear folds up into the engine cowling, and we spin around towards the front, highlighting once again the tricycle undercarriage. Now unfortunately, I couldn't get inside this aircraft as it's pretty sparse inside. While the long-term plan is to return to airworthiness, it's a long way off, although hopefully I'll get inside in the future. In the end, 1,170 C-54s and 80 DC-4s were built, with such a small number of the latter being because there was such a huge surplus after the war, so they just ended up converting old military C-54s into passenger versions, similar to what happened with the DC-3s and C-47s. Eventually, the DC-4 was stretched, pressurised and given upgraded engines to form the DC-6, which went on to compete with the Lockheed Constellation. The DC-4 was popular in post-war Australia, flown by Qantas, Trans-Australian Airlines, Australian National Airlines, and later ANSET ANA. This aircraft, as well as many others, are on display at the Haas Aviation Museum, just south of Sydney, and open to the public. It's well worth a visit if you're an Avgeek, and don't forget to check out my channel for many other tours through historical aircraft. Thanks for watching.